So yes, indeed, we are going to be talking about sexually transmitted infections today. This is clap back, giving you some gonorrhea and chlamydia updates. So sexually transmitted infections have, of course, been with us for as long as people have been having sex. Um, in fact, the ancient Roman physician Galen coined the term gonorrhea, which literally means flow of semen, presumably referring to the vaginal discharge that was experienced by patients who were having this disease. But over the years, these illnesses have gone by a lot of different names. Uh, the clap is a really particularly interesting one. This nickname is specifically for gonorrhea, but the origin of this nickname is a little bit unclear. So one possible origin is from the old English word clapan, which means beating or throbbing, and could we think refer to the kind of painful burning urination or maybe swelling of the penis or the vagina labia area that can be caused by gonorrhea. Another theory is that it is, the term is a bastardization of the French word clapier, which is an old term for brothel and is also the term for a nest of rabbits, which of course have a reputation for being particularly sexually active. But the last theory is possibly the best, and this is from medieval times. And at that time, gonorrhea was thought to be cured by clapping the penis, either forcefully between the hands or by slamming it between two heavy objects, like a hard surface and, surface and a heavy book, and this would expel the discharge and thus they thought cure the disease. Luckily, our treatments have come a long way since then, but despite our improved treatments, infections are on the rise. So between 2015 and 2019, the most recent year that we have CDC data on this, chlamydia infections increased by 19%, and gonorrhea infections increased by a whopping 56%, which represents an all-time high for the sixth consecutive year. Along with this increase in cases, we have witnessed an increase in resistance. And gonorrhea in particular can really quickly develop resistance. So between 2013 and 2018, we saw the percentage of gonorrhea infections with reduced susceptibility to azithrozy azithromycin rise from 0.6% to 4.6%, which is a seven-fold increase in just a matter of a few years. And in fact, in 2019, more than half of all gonorrhea infections in the U.S. were estimated to be resistant to at least one antibiotic. And this is particularly a problem among our patient population of men who have sex with men. In 2018, among this population specifically, we saw infections with this critical azithromycin alert in 8.6% of all cases versus just 2.9% of cases in men who exclusively had sex with women. Now, combination therapy is um, using a, an effective gonococcal therapeutic plus co-treatment for chlamydia has been recommended since way back in 1985. And this is primarily because in our patient population, we have not yet ruled out one infection or the other. So we just have to treat for both. And old guidelines were ceftriaxone 250 milligrams IM to treat gonorrhea plus azithromycin one gram orally to treat the chlamydia. However, due to rising resistance, the CDC gave us new updates in December 2020. So indeed, despite the COVID pandemic, they can, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time and they address this as well, which is fantastic. So the new guidelines call for the ceftriaxone dose to increase to 500 milligrams IM. And this is because in their pharmacokinetic modeling, it showed that the lowest effective dose that was needed for 100% eradication of gonorrhea at 48 hours post-treatment was this 500 milligram dose. Then we have to add doxycycline now. We're getting rid of the azithro and we're going with doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice daily for seven days. This is, of course, due to the rising resistance for chlamydia, along with pretty much everything else that we want to treat to azithromycin. It's no longer a wonder drug for us. There are a couple of special circumstances we need to be aware of. The first is for pregnant patients. We are going to still increase our dose of ceftriaxone, but we're going to stick with the azithromycin in this patient population because we don't want to be giving them the doxy. And then for our larger patients, our patients who weigh more than 150 kilograms, 
Doxy is just fine, but that ceftriaxone dose has to go up even higher. So instead of doing the 500 milligrams IM injection, you're going to go with a full gram injection. Now, your discharge instructions have to include telling the patient to abstain from any sexual intercourse until completion of their entire course of antibiotics, which is more difficult now because they're taking a whole week of medications and resolution of all of their symptoms and until any sex partners have completed their treatment. Otherwise, they're just going to be passing it back and forth. It is imperative that these sexual partners are treated. And depending on the laws in your state, and in most states, it's okay, we are usually able to use expedited partner therapy for treatment. So the CDC recommends expedited partner therapy specifically for heterosexual partners of patients who are diagnosed with either gonorrhea or chlamydia. And that's because of increased risk of other sexually transmitted fictions in other patient populations. Since in our patients, we don't know whether it's gonorrhea or chlamydia, any of this expedited partner therapy is going to have to be to treat for both. So how do we do that? Partners can be treated with a single oral dose of 800 milligrams of cefixime plus the 100 milligrams of oral doxy twice daily for seven days. These partners should be given the appropriate warnings about taking these medications, of course, general STI education, encouragement to seek their own medical evaluation. And that's really important for any female partner you're going to be treating without seeing because they're at risk for PID or TOA, which this is not going to sufficiently treat. All patients need to be offered testing for HIV. Luckily, despite increasing rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia, the rates of HIV have remained relatively consistent since 2015, but the rates of syphilis are up 74% since 2015. So any patient with an STI is of course going to be at risk for another STI. So we owe it to them and our communities to offer screening for these other infections if we're going to be treating for one STI that we think we have found. So in our patient population, empiric treatment based on history and physical exam findings is generally what is recommended. Specifically, the CDC says that we should be treating right away for patients who are considered at an increased risk for any STIs. So that's younger patients, patients younger than age 25, any patient with new sex partner or a patient with a sex partner who has other sex partners um, or whose sex partner has a known sexually transmitted infection. And perhaps most importantly for our patient population, they do recommend that we treat patients for whom follow-up cannot be insured, which is basically all of our patients. We we don't necessarily know that our patients are going to follow up. So if you're suspecting this illness, you're supposed to go ahead and treat. That said, I would still recommend testing. And I think it's worth discussing for a few minutes here, the best method for testing. So for male patients, there is an overwhelming abundance of evidence that describes the performance of the male first catch urine sample. So not a clean catch, first catch urine sample is equivalent to, and sometimes actually superior to a urethral swab. So a urethral swab is essentially useless in this this situation. It's invasive and I would assume probably painful. So go ahead and stick with a first catch urine sample on a man. It's a little more complicated for women. So for our female patients, it's actually vaginal swabs that are the preferred sample. So vaginal swab specimens are as sensitive as our cervical swab specimens that most of us were probably taught to do in medical school. And there's really no significant difference in their specificity. On top of that, this is kind of great. A vaginal swab that is collected by the patient herself is equivalent in sensitivity and specificity to those that we collect during our own exam. So if for some reason you're foregoing a pelvic exam, which is a topic for another day, or or you could go back and watch last year's talk on pelvic exams. Um, If you're going to forego it, you could have a patient collect a sample on their own, or let's say they decline a pelvic exam, you could have them collect their sample on their own. So cervical sample is great. If you're doing the pelvic exam, you can go ahead and get that. But even then, a vaginal swab is considered to be an appropriate test. If you are going to use urine in your female patient, just like with the man, it has to be a first catch urine. So we're talking about a dirty urine sample. And this is complicated in the ER because this is not going to be the same clean catch that we want our patient to give us for their dipstick. So this means potentially getting two urine samples from your patients. 
Even then, even if you're using a dirty first catch urine on your female patient, it may detect up to 10% fewer infections when compared to our vaginal or endocervical swabs. So it really is probably not the best option for our female patients. I think it is important to get these tests, however, because if your emergency department is anything like mine, you will likely have patients who um, are cervicitis or urethritis frequent flyers. So I've seen this many times where patients come back over and over and over again for these similar symptoms. On chart review, their tests are consistently coming back negative. So they get empirically treated and you go back and you look at their cultures and they're negative over and over and over again. It worries me that just dosing them again in the ER with their ceftriaxone and their doxy is A, not helping them, and B, making our resistance problems worse. So just a word on these recurrent symptoms. In a man who's presenting with recurrent symptoms, in whom you are not worried about compliance problems or repeat exposures, of course, you want to be thinking about trichomonas vaginalis, especially in a man who's having sex with women, and mycoplasma genitalium. Ideally, you're going to get to test these prior to treating them, but you might have to refer them to like an, a special STD clinic in order to get those tests. Again, in women, it's a little bit more complicated. So in women, you have to think about trick and mycoplasma, of course. Whoa, kitty. Kitty just um, dumped things over. We're fine. Um, in, in women, you're going to want to think about trichomonas and mycoplasma, but also consider issues like abnormal vaginal flora, douching, chemical irritants, or even cervical dysplasia. So according to the CD, there's actually no data to support antimicrobials in persistent cervicitis without identifying the specific etiology. So here you're definitely going to want to get the patient in to see the gynecologist. So if you see the patient coming in over and over and over again for the same thing and their tests are always negative, make sure you get them referred in to see the specialist. I do want to end this talk with a word on disparities, kind of calling back to where we just were. So in 2019, over half of all reported cases of STIs were among adolescents and young adults from the ages of 15 to 24. Not terribly surprising there. There are racial disparities, however, of, as well in the rates of these infections. In 2019, a little over 30% of all cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis were among non-Hispanic non Black individuals, even though they made up only about 12.5% of the U.S. population. And additionally, men who have sex with men are disproportionately impacted by STDs, including syphilis and gonorrhea. It's important for us to recognize that these disparities are really unlikely explained alone by differences in sexual behavior, or even at all by differences in sexual behavior, but rather reflect different access to quality sexual health care. So it's important that we acknowledge these inequities in order to empower these affected groups and to pressure our public health community to address the systemic inequities involved in the burden of these diseases. So what do I ultimately think you need to remember? Well, infections seem to be on the rise, and unfortunately, so is antibiotic resistance. We have a couple of special circumstances that you need to keep in mind, including pregnant patients and those weighing more than 150 kilograms. So if you have one of those populations, go ahead and look up what you need to do. But in general, our new basic recommendation is to increase the dose of ceftriaxone to 500 milligrams IM and to switch from azithromycin instead to using a week-long course of doxycycline. With good antibiotic stewardship, we can hopefully clap back against the rising STI infections and antibiotic resistance that are plaguing our patients and our emergency departments. Thank you very much.